I'm here with Jenny Vega. Jenny, how are you? Good. How are you? I am good. I'm stoked to have you. We were just talking about this offline, and I noticed that um, when I sent out the invite and you accepted with your email address that you work at Cutco, the knife company, right? Yes. And you've been doing it since 2002, which is amazing. That I know you took a little bit of a break. You can talk about that, but that you've been doing it this long because a lot of people don't last that long. And you're like one of the top sales ladies, sales persons in the entire company, which is crazy. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to talk about real estate. Jenny and them have short term rentals. They're doing fix and flips. They're expanding. So we're getting all into the nitty gritty. But I want to like hit on this Cutco thing first because I think it can relate to the success you've had in real estate. And also, I'm just personally like intrigued because I've been in sales in my entire career and Cutco is one of the best places to learn. I took the CentOS route. I went to CentOS out of college and learned how to learn there or learned how to sell there. Uh, but I also had some buddies who went the Cutco route and they said it was a fantastic way to get started in sales, to build up that confidence, to learn how to communicate with people, all that good stuff. So I'm going to stop talking. I want to hear all about your experience at Cutco and how you've been able to have so much success in a very like tough type of selling environment. Yeah, sure. So back when I started, um, you know, what they taught us to do was to rely on scripts and scripts are everything. And so we started with friends and family and then you use a script to call referrals that they give you. Um, and you basically ask if you can go to the homes of your, you know, your friends and families, their friends and family, um, and do a demonstration to, you know, show Cutco. And all by referral. So think Pampered Chef, but without the party. And the only reason that someone wouldn't make it in Cutco is because they wouldn't follow the script. So Cutco is actually very, very easy to sell. The product sells itself. What isn't so easy is lead generation. And that's where the work comes in. So if you're confident um, as a college student, because most of Cutco in the home is sold by college students, if you master your script and you have the confidence to ask for leads and referrals and you follow the program that they teach you word by word, you succeed and you have no problem getting referrals and having a book of business. But it's just amazing how most people don't follow a simple script and system. And so re relating that to, to real estate, um, systems are already there. Like so many people have already proven that you can do short-term rentals, or you can fix and flip, or you can do wholesaling, you can buy commercial property, and there's so many trainings out there, and there's so many people that spend thousands and thousands of dollars on whatever it might be, whether it's a course to do Airbnb, or it's a course to buy office buildings or apartments, but only a small percent of people will actually take the action and follow that system and implement it. And that's with everything in life because it's so easy to do it, but it's also so easy not to do it. It's yeah. so easy to go to the gym, but it's so easy not to go to the gym. Good old fashioned discipline. Yes. And a lot of people lack it and not in all areas of their life. I feel like some people are strong and disciplined in certain areas and then they just totally, totally neglect. And if we can find that balance and show up every day and follow methods that have already been proven, man, it makes it a lot easier to have success and it expedites, expedites the process because we're not having to figure everything out on our own. And I have, I've been kind of more of the, hey, wing it, figure it out, you know, scramble till you get it done. And now that our business, the finance cowboy business has grown, I have people working for me, I have had to stop and literally build out systems and build out scripts for our sales team and, and, you know, help our copywriting. And it's like, man, the, the success, and we're still working. I mean, it's a process to, to refine, but the success and the, like how fast you can grow is so much greater when you have those systems in place and you're obviously continually make, continually making them better. But if you don't have them, man, it makes life hard. Exactly. And it also comes down to making that decision, like how, how bad you want to do something, because if you don't have that decision made, it's so much easier not to follow through. So for me, you know, I was the worst salesperson in my office, but I just, you know, trucked on anyway, because I made that decision. So no sale after no sale after no sale, when most people would give up, but 
if you just decide, so say for example, that you decide you want to buy your first rental, but you, you look at 10 to 20 houses and none of them are the right fit and you're offered that you keep making offers and they get rejected. So, you know, right now it's easier to buy, but a year or two ago it wasn't. So, so many investors would have just given up. But if you make that decision, you're not going to give up. You keep going. It's like that right house is going to, you know, you're going to find it. So that same, you know, same example to real yeah. estate. I always say the destiny is your destiny is on the other side of not giving up. So many people yeah. give up right before they're about to accomplish what they set out to accomplish. But it's hard. I mean, anything worth having is hard. You know, uh, being the best salesperson in your company, that is hard. Mm-hmm. Buying real estate, learning how to do it, it's hard. Raising kids, it's, I mean, all of it. Anything that's worth anything in life, it's going to take a little bit of work. But if you will just not give up, like if you don't quit, you win, essentially, unless you're just going down some terrible road. So that's really cool. So how long did it take you to go from, you know, worst salesperson in the company to I got this thing figured out and I am crushing? And then how did you like niche down, which I think it's cool what you do within Cutco that probably what a lot of other people don't do. So it took me probably six months to figure, figure things out. And then it took me about a year to get to their top promotion, which takes most people about four to five months. Gotcha. So it was a little delayed. Yes. Yeah. A lot. Once you got it, it was, (laughs) it was off to the races. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And um, it actually took my manager coming with me on a demonstration and do what we call reverse field training to watch me and tell me what I was doing wrong. Um, And such a such a a thing I believe in to this day. And it's so uncomfortable for people, but something I really believe in. So having people kind of watch what you're doing, whether it be and this can be applied to even like wholesaling or um, so many parts of, of real estate, you know, Airbnb owners have another owner come to your Airbnb and actually, you know, inspect it. Like what's, what's, you know, what can you improve with it? What amenities are you lacking? You know, um, what could we, what could you do different with your design? Um, have it, even having them check out your listing, you know, things like that. There's so many different things your peers can kind of, um, cross check what you're doing, give you different tips. What gets measured gets managed. That yeah. is, um, th- that's spot on. I, I personally want to sit here and just make this a sales podcast. I'm not going to do that to our <laughs> listeners because they are expecting this to be a real estate podcast. So we're going to shift, but I just, I want to dive into like, what's your systems? How do you formulate your scripts? How are you guys getting the referrals? Oh, I want all the secrets, but I'm not going to do that to you, to you <laughs> listeners out there. Although I selfishly want to learn all of the juice uh, from Jenny when it comes to sales. But you guys got into real estate investing, I believe, in 2020. You got up to seven short-term rentals. That's kind of been your niche. You started branching out to fix and flips as of late. You just sold a short-term rental. So you got a lot going on here. You scaled very quickly. It's, you started in 2020. It's 2023. And to have seven short-term rentals at one time, is uh, it's a lot of work. Um, that, that's, a, that's a lot of scaling. Somebody may look and say, oh, that's only seven units. Number one, it's not just only seven units. That's a lot of units for anything, but it's seven short-term units. And so that's a totally different ballgame than buying long-term rentals. So kind of give us that origin story of when you got the bug, when you jumped, why mm-hmm. short-term rental? Yeah, so we read the book by Steve Chater, Hold, H-O-L-D at the very end of 2019. And it's a very simple book, very easy to read. And it's all about just buying real estate, not short-term rental. It's about buying long-term, you know, like long-term rentals and how even just through um, like tax tax savings and appreciation on average, it's a 28% cash on cash return. And so I read this book, and first of all, I couldn't believe that I had never heard of this book before or heard of the concept of real estate investing, because um, in 2010, I had taken the Cutco concept and I had joined their Realtor Gift Program, which is where we sell Cutco to real estate agents as closing gifts. And um, since 2010, I was now specifically only working with Realtors. So in a given week, I was talking to probably 50 realtors and you would think that, you know, I would hear about real estate investing, but I almost never did. So most realtors do not actually invest in in real estate. Clueless. 
Right. So I was happy to read the book, but I was also really disappointed that all, all these years, nobody had brought this up to me because I would have loved to have bought real estate in 2010, <laughs> especially in Phoenix, where homes then were like $80,000. Um, so fast forward to the end of 2019, I'm reading this book and I think, oh my gosh, we have to take action like right now. Um, so being from Wisconsin and being familiar with that area and knowing how much cheaper real estate was there, we decided to start there because in Phoenix, real estate is much more expensive and we were really uncomfortable with spending $300,000 on our first house. So in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we could get something for under 200,000. So our first one was 160,000. And at first we were going to do long-term rental, but as we got near the closing date, we decided short-term rental because we ran the numbers and um, there's different websites where you can do this on, like there's price labs, um, for example, their market dashboard, you can see uh, different cities and different neighborhoods, and you can see like what the average Airbnbs um, yield per year. And then there's another website called AirDNA. And so we saw that the home would on average gross about 35000 a year. And um, last year in 2022, that house actually grossed almost 40, uh, actually over 49000 so um, in short-term rental world, you're going to net about half of what you gross after all your expenses. So that house has done really well. And um, it's not in a vacation market at all. And most short-term rental investors would never think to buy in that state. <laughs> and definitely not in this neighborhood. Um, it's not even in a nice neighborhood. So, But it does really well. And it's actually our highest rated Airbnb. And That's it's the one that people would least expect. Um, it's actually like a B minus C plus neighborhood. How so, did you market it? How do you think it's been so successful? You know, it's just, it's a good value. It, it sleeps up to 10 people. And um, it's just, I mean, it's pretty close to downtown. It's pretty close to the airport. It's a cute historic house. Uh, it's clean. It's not fancy. And um it's just, it's well stocked, you know? In fact, if I, if I had a, I don't even think it's really up to 2023 standards. Um, I, I think it's just like the price, you know, it's, it's a fair price. Um, on, on a weekend, it's like 200 bucks, 250 a night. So, um, yeah, so that's definitely, it's, you know, I've actually showed that to other short-term rental investors and been scolded because they don't think it's up to, uh, 2023 standards. Um, You're like, look at my bank account, scold me all you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's the first one we bought. And then, um, in 2021, we bought in Oklahoma, um, not too far from Tulsa. Cause that's where I went to college. I was somewhat familiar with that market. So that was 92,000. So that was super cheap. And then, um, in later 2021, we bought in the Smokies, that was 350 grand and that came with a plot of land. So we, we built across the road from that and that cabin. Got in lost. Just in time. Yeah. Just and in that, time that, the that, cabin. Ride that one up. <laughs> yes. And that Love. cabin was launched early this year and that one it's too early to tell, but that one should finish off somewhere in the nineties yeah. um, for the year. And then, um, then we, in 2022, we bought a trailer near the Grand Canyon that was completely run down. People thought we were crazy. We renovated it, um, spent about 50 grand on the renovation. So we were all into that one for about 280,000. And that one grosses somewhere in the fifties, like 55, 58,000 a year, close to 60, just under 60 last year, actually. This year is going to be a little less possibly is it um, on that road like okay tell me if i'm wrong i'm about to get in the weeds here when you're coming from grand canyon there's a road that takes you to flagstaff or there's another road there's really only two ways in right is it on the one that isn't on the way to flagstaff it's not on the way to flagstaff that's yes, i-30 way. this is okay. um this is the one that goes directly from williams to the grand yep. canyon so i stayed at a house i guarantee it's got to be close to where you bought this like trailer if probably like there's no lights out there 
It's yeah. very dark. And it's like this, I don't want to call it a neighborhood, but it was like, there's desolate, desolate, desolate along this road. And then all of a sudden there's a place with houses on the left and we like stayed over there. So I don't know if you're anywhere close yeah. to that, but that's like, it was, it's yeah. a really cool area. It would crush it in the Airbnb game. We got stuck on that road, by the way, there was a crash. It's a two lane road. Oh so we yeah. That's the same road. Grand Canyon. Yeah. Yes. We sat there for like three hours because you had to wait I don't know what was going on, but it was like, there was no getting around it. It was crazy. Yeah. Insane. So if you get stuck on that road. Yeah. And so that, that one's been really uh, an interesting property and it's actually been a challenge. It's, I mean, I think people think, you know, people have dreams of like um, going out into that area or areas near national parks and setting up a glamping resort and, you know, these rural areas, but they don't realize that it's hard to find cleaners. Now I've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. I have the best cleaner. But if she were to move away, I'd be lost. Um, very hard to find handymen there. You know, when you're in areas like that and Home Depot is 40 minutes away, that is a challenge. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to pay a premium for every, every fix on the, on the house. Um, you have to haul water, you know, and then when, when it snows in the winter, believe it or not, you know, we have two, these two properties in Wisconsin. We also bought one in uh, south central wisconsin that's our jewel property that one um, grosses a hundred thousand plus a year mm. and was under four hundred thousand. that's like our prime that's what we want to re replicate and that one we had growth this year and some of our other properties were a little bit down and then we bought one early this year in panama city beach um, that we actually are selling and that's going to be officially sold this week and not because it did right. bad it did well but just because we realized we got to this point where we were spread too thin, we were in too many markets. Um, it's a seven hour flight to get there. And it wasn't even possible for us to enjoy it ourselves, which is not a criteria to buy short term rental. But we just got to this point where, you know, that property would probably gross like 55,000 a year, which is not bad. But then you have, you know, in Florida, you have the hurricane insurance. You have, um, you have seasonality, which I do not like, and I've realized that. So we, when you get to short-term rental number seven, now you've, you've got higher standards, you know? So now it's like that short-term rental number seven for us, number eight, number nine, they should be in pockets that we're already in. They should be grossing over a hundred thousand a year, bare minimum. So, so we, we just, we sold that one, but um, but back to what I was saying about, so with the Grand Canyon, uh, I just think people should really have their eyes wide open when they're fantasizing about these rural properties and their glamping resorts and just yeah. really know what they're getting into. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because your team is everything, especially when you're doing it out of state or out of town. Like mine are, is a little over four hours. I used to have two that were a little over four hours and um, you know, I teach a lot of people who invest out of state and that is key. Your team is everything. And so mm -hmm. if you're going into this rural area where you don't have a team, you're, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And so, uh, you know, make sure you understand what you're getting into, what you're doing. You said something earlier that I want to dive in on a little bit. You said people have kind of commented that your property, that one property isn't up to 2023 standards. So I want to talk about, not necessarily specific to that particular property, you can correlate it, but what does that mean up to 2023 standards? I have my take on what I think it means, but I want to let you expound on, on where we're at in the short-term rental world today, maybe compared to where we were even when you started in 2020. Hey guys, when you're just starting out as a real estate investor, finding deals is the most important thing you can do. But unfortunately, it can also be your biggest hurdle. And let me tell you, it gets even harder when your business grows and you don't have a lot of time to look for properties and evaluate deals like you did on the front end. That's why you need to work with New Western. New Western has properties ready for rehab on their marketplace today. That means you skip the hours of research, driving neighborhoods, or calling agents, and instead, you get to start with a ready-made property. You can rehab and flip it or rehab it and burr it and hold it as a rental. So why is New Western good at what they do? Well, they buy and sell a property every 13 minutes. They work exclusively with investors and value add properties, and that's all they do. They're licensed agents, they have a network of contractors and lenders, and they'll help you grow your business. So if you're ready to jumpstart your next project, visit newwestern.com, join their marketplace, 
and access the largest private source of rehab properties in the nation. So mostly design. I mean, design is everything. A lot of properties, you know, I, I look at them and they, they're all like gray, like gray furniture, bland, you know, really properties should stand out and just pop, you know, color, like accents of color. Um, theme properties are really the trend right now. Um, so any future future properties that we buy, we would really probably either theme it or just have impeccable design. But um, some learning lessons that we had with Florida, our Florida property, and again, it, it was rented all the time. It, it did well, but it didn't have a pool. And mm. you cannot design up or amenity up a property if it's in a certain location that should have or could have something like that that other properties do like if you're not on the beach it doesn't matter what your unit looks like or what amenities you put in it if people want beachfront and you're not beachfront you can't compete yeah. so like um, mountains better have views <laughs> like, actually we don't have you we, we we actually don't have views in our properties we would certainly do better if we had views yes um we are fortunate both of our properties in the smokies don't have views one of them is a like a storybook theme um the other one is a brand new build kind of with some like treehouse views but no doubt if if we if we had mountain views we would probably gross twenty thousand more a year um, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you do have mountain views, you could afford to have bland furniture and it would still yeah. rent. <laughs> so there's, yeah. I've ha I had this conversation the other day with somebody and all Airbnb investors that I talked to are saying the same thing. Every one of them. I'm not as heavily in the space anymore because I'm down to one and I'm not, not involved with it at all. Somebody else manages it, but I'm, I hear the trends from talking with smart people like yourself and other investors and we're at the place in Airbnb right now where design wins. When I first started, I bought my first Airbnb, I think it was 2019. I can never remember if it was 2018 or 2019, one of the two. And it was a different game back then. There wasn't as much competition by any means. And so, you know, like, for example, the house that I had, it was like I was like one of the few on the island that was doing an Airbnb. And so I didn't have to necessarily stand out. Well, fast forward to 2023. I'm not the only one on the island anymore. There are a lot of properties that are now listed on Airbnb. And it's like anything in life. The best is going to win. And, and I, I was having this conversation. I can't remember with, with who it was. It was a couple podcasts ago. But we, we talked about how Airbnb is almost losing its middle class. So <laughs> you can be successful in Airbnb if you're luxury. I don't know if that's the right word, but we'll use it. Like you host a lot of people, your design's dope, or you got beachfront or you can see the mountain views or you went on price and people are literally booking you for value but if you're in the between like you're talking about you got the you don't have the views you're not on the beach you got the gray walls there's nothing that pops i think that's a dying breed in airbnb what's your take yeah. on that yeah i agree and there's actually data to back that up i was yep. reading an article about this recently and that is a fact yes yeah. definitely interesting interesting so Guys and gals listening to this, if you're taking like anything from this podcast from Jenny, make sure that you win with design if you're going to get into the Airbnb space. Be creative. And design you know, can mean a number of different things like we were just talking about. It can mean location. Like if you win big on location, well, then actual aesthetic design may not have to be up to par with somebody who doesn't win on the best location who – then has to get creative. And there's so many different ways to get creative. You could probably hop on Pinterest or Google mm -hmm. creative interior Airbnbs. People do like down in Disney, they're doing, we have a guy in our uh, rental Academy. He did a um, superhero theme. It's like Spider-Man or Batman. The whole house is Spider-Man. You know, I've seen people in Nashville, they do the little angel wings, you know, that's big in Nashville. So people can go into the Airbnb and take pictures in front of the, the angel wings. Like what can you do for when people are looking at your booking, say, that's where I want to go and mm -hmm. then deliver with the product when they actually arrive. And I, man, I think that's just such an important thing today because there's a lot of people in the Airbnb space right now, which I think that'll probably thin out here um, yeah. in the, the next couple of years. But as it stands today, you got to find a way to win. Exactly. Yeah. And hire a designer. Absolutely. Yes. They're worth it. Yes. Great advice. So what has been, 
the biggest challenge when it comes to Airbnbs for you, when it comes to managing? I've had long-term rentals. I have short-term rentals. I've had mobile home parks. I've done it all, fix and flips. And I, you know, from a rental perspective, short-term rentals definitely have more volatility, if that's the right word. I don't want to make it sound like a negative. But, like, compared to my long-term rentals, like, you buy them, get somebody in there, and you don't really hear about it for a while. Short-term rentals just isn't that way. And so how have you put systems, like we talked about earlier, in place to make everything flow as smoothly as possible? Mm -hmm. So one of our, I guess one of our challenges and something every host experiences is when you get like a four star review and Mm. the emotional roller coaster that, you know, controlling those reviews can have on you. And explain real quick, like what a four star means on Airbnb. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not a four star. (laughs) It's bad. It's like really bad. You have to maintain 4.8 to keep super host. So sometimes a guest will leave a four star review thinking that's good. It's good in hotel standards, but it's really bad for Airbnb. So we, we can, we now control that really, really well. And we very rarely get a four star. So what we do is we have um, automated messaging before they check out and we train them to not leave a four star. So um, we actually explain to them in the automated messaging, we explain what, what, you know, what a five star means and how we, we have to, you know, we're trying to maintain super host. And we do this in a very, and that's kind of where, you know, you have to have some sales skills, marketing, how to work things. So we say this in a very, um, classy way. And we just kind of, edu- you have to educate your guests because they don't know. So it's about education. Um, and we just tell them how much it means to us to get five-star reviews. And then if anything fell short of that during their stay to let us know. And we also have a check-in message at 11 AM the day after they arrive to ask how things are going. And at first I thought that was a little bit like annoying, but I had another host tell me that was, you know, really a game changer for her to get more five star reviews. So even if they don't respond, people people know that you're being attentive. And then the day before checkout, having that message, um, and then on top of that, a couple hours after they check out, we send them another message. When the trigger comes to us, where Airbnb sends you the trigger that you review them, then we message them and we say. Thanks so much for leaving the house or the cabin so tidy. We just left you an all five star review. So we just train them. We train them really, really well. Um, and that's how we almost never get four stars. You and in the times that. that we have had four stars, um, we have actually, in some cases, we have actually called the guest. And um, if, if it was for like, a, like something was wrong, like in Tennessee in the winter sometimes, um, a lot of cabins will have, um, if you're in a well, there, there's going to be issues with that, um, you know, and so like with, you know, the water and things like that. So we'll, we'll call them and explain that to them. Or if there's like a weather issue, we'll have a conversation on the phone and we'll just ask them if they'll call Airbnb and remove their review. And they almost always will. Yeah. I think that's very important. I, yeah. This is fantastic advice, Jenny. I appreciate you sharing. Um, you have to fight for those reviews until mm-hmm. you get savvy enough and you understand how the game is played. I remember we did the exact same thing when we first started. Now we've got good systems in place with all the automated. We probably I added it up the other day. I just want to say six automated messages somewhere in that ballpark. I don't have them in front of me, um, but we do. We kind of guide them to a five star review. We literally say in a, a more salesmanship way, hey. Leave us a five star review. If it if you're not gonna leave us a five star review, don't leave a review and call me directly instead. Like yeah. that's essentially what I'm training them to do. And um, our you know reviews have skyrocketed since then. But at the beginning, I was still learning. And I would encourage anybody, especially if you're just starting to get reviews, do whatever it takes legally and um, financially to get good reviews at the beginning (laughs) because if you get bad ones at the beginning you're putting yourself behind the eight ball and we did the same thing where somebody would leave us a four star or three star at the beginning then just not knowing any better and i called them i was like hey i'll comp a night of your stay you know or hey i've refunded somebody their entire stay before if it's say it was two nights on a weekday to literally call airbnb and remove the review because we know it's so important because every future booking is based on previous and that's why i say airbnb is a little more volatile as you 
you're teeter tottering there. Like at any moment, like somebody could come in and sabotage you. Hopefully they don't if you're a good host, but it's kind of scary. And guests are starting to understand the game a little bit too. And most people Mm -hmm. don't act like that. They're not sleazy people, but there are some people who know like you need a five star review and they will take advantage of you to get that, which is just sad. Yes. It's just sad. So what does the future look like for you guys? with uh your real estate moving forward so i know we were talking offline you're starting to mix in some fix and flips and potentially may go to wholesaling it sounds like you guys are want to replace active income with like all in on real estate is that true yeah well i'm gonna i'm gonna you know keep doing cutco um that's always gonna stay but we do want to also this is actually gonna be um my husband is gonna be pretty active in this too is um wholesaling because that does relate to real estate and that can also supplement um, that active income is also going to tie into our real estate investing. Cause we're going to also as a byproduct of that stumble upon more uh, flips and more homes for ourselves too. Um, so we just started a course. We just um, started um, actually the Astro flipping course um, and we started agent investors. So we're doing two courses And so that's kind of been interesting. So this week we're doing like the action steps and feeling like newbies all over again. So some of those same feelings I had over 20 years ago with Cutco, where you don't know what you're doing and making mistakes and um, that sort of thing. Uh, So, and then we do want to do fix and flips and we're doing our first one right now. And we've made so many like rookie mistakes um, that I'm too embarrassed to even fully talk about, but I can say that we, being out of state, we didn't realize until three weeks in, three weeks after we went live, that we had a couple uh, defects with our rehab. So we had all these people walking through the flip and we didn't know until later, till one of our boots on the ground sent a video to us, which we should have had day one. Like, what were we thinking? We just assumed everything was perfect and it wasn't. So yeah, so major learning lesson. Um, and I really hope that uh, by the time we air this, that's going to be sold. It has to be sold. Um, so just a good learning lesson, but I'm glad we did it because I think that's going to prepare us, you know, as we wholesale, we we want to have that experience. And because uh, most wholesalers haven't, haven't actually done a flip themselves. And we want to be able to like walk our clients through our experience. And, you know, so now we're going to have at least the one flip under our belt and be able to tell them what not to do if they're new to flipping yeah. and also have, you know, buy and holds and the, the short-term rentals too under, under the belt. So, but we do want to do um, some flips just with caution. Cause um, you know, you gotta be, you know, a little smart, smarter than you were a couple of years ago. Um, I think the average time on market now is like 30 to 40 days. Yep. So it's changed a little bit from a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I think it's good to do flips yeah. personally in moderation. This is just my mm-hmm. personal take. Somebody could argue and put a good argument against it, but any guy or gal I've ever talked to that has mm-hmm. gone bust or got close to bankruptcy or struggled because of real estate, it's because they had too many flips going at one time in a market turn. That's, yeah. I, I don't hear it from guys who had rentals. You know, they say, oh, yeah, it was tight there for a little bit, but we weathered. But you talk to somebody who, a developer who had lines of credit out developing a big neighborhood or whatever they were doing, or people who were flipping, they tend to run into trouble. And so I flip, but I do it very modestly. Like, I, I personally don't have a ton of them going on at one time because that's, I don't want to get burned. Like, I'm not in this to, I want to control risk. <laughs> like, I want to make a good living, create wealth. Yeah. Hand it down to my family and not put myself in any in any dumb situations. How many Airbnbs do you think? I know this is subjective, so you're not going to be able to give a black and white answer, but I'd love to open the conversation. How many Airbnbs do you think it takes to get quote unquote financial freedom to where you have income coming in that has a pretty strong impact on your life? Well, I think um, let's see. I think of, I think four or five of the right ones could have a really significant impact on someone. I agree. I think so. Because they, for those of you who don't understand the difference between like an Airbnb and a long-term rental, when you're doing the short-term rental space, generally 
speaking, your cash flow, like the income you're bringing is significantly higher. And so you don't need as many units to change your life with cash flow. Now, there are a lot of benefits that I won't dive into on this podcast. You can go to previous ones and listens to doing something outside of Airbnb. I think it's good to diversify and have both. Um, so yes, the income's great. There are some downfalls where long-term boring single family rentals, I think can be better maybe for building foundation for, for certain people with certain types of incomes and things of that nature. But the beautiful thing about when you get to the Airbnb space is I think Chad Carson, he didn't write a book on Airbnbs, but just came out with a book called the small and mighty investor. Like you don't have to have a lot of these. And if you're a good operator, good designer or hire a good designer, designer or hire a good architect, you can go from, you know, let's say a long-term rental is going to bring in $1,500 a month Well, an Airbnb can bring in five to $7,000 a month and even more, but there's that much of a discrepancy. Your, your fees end up being a little bit higher, a decent amount higher, but at the end of the day, the, the total amount of profit that you have coming in is substantial. And so it doesn't take a lot. And I, I bet it was cool for you guys. Like, did you, did you really understand what you were getting into? Like when you started seeing the income coming in, were you just kind of like, holy crap, like this works. It's real. Yeah. Um, it was, so the, the first week we launched Milwaukee, uh, in early 2020, we got like a, I think it was a $5,000 booking for the DNC. Cause that was coming up like the following spring or summer. Yep. And, uh, that was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so that was like, I think that was only like a three night booking too, or something crazy like that. So that was definitely that moment, you know, and I think it was only after like three months of being live, we were already like 20,000 gross ahead of us. And this was like winter in Wisconsin, you know, like who would ever think, right? Um, so that was, yeah, that was that moment. And then we got like a three week booking right away with a guy that was like working at the hospital in the neighborhood. And that was definitely that moment. Um, so yeah, it, it is fun. It's fun. But I also think it's, it's good to uh, di 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 diversify and not put all, if you're going to do Airbnb, I don't think it's a good idea to put all your eggs in like one market. And um, I like that we are diversified. Some of our Airbnbs, we could, we could make long-term rental, you know, and some are in true vacation markets. So we have a little bit of all of that going on. That's really cool. Yeah. You, you guys have done a fantastic job of, like you said, the Milwaukee property not in a vacation market. And then you got the Smoky Mountains and you had the, uh, what'd you say, Pensacola, Florida. Uh, yeah, we did have Panama City. Panama City. Yeah, yeah. that we just so, sold. So yeah. you've, hit, you've hit some different markets and you're able to test out mm -hmm. what's worked, what hasn't, pivot, be able to make decisions uh, to, to make you know, better buys in the future. So I think that's cool. Would you say real estate's changed your life? Yeah, definitely. But it's, it's a slow, uh, slow thing. It's, it's, you know, we started about three years ago and it's probably going to be another, you know, five to 10 years before we're going to totally be able to like step back. Yeah. So it is years, very slow, success. very slow. <laughs> yeah. The success you guys have had in three years though is, is pretty ridiculous to buy seven Airbnbs in, in three years and, and have that type of revenue coming in. Um, that's pretty amazing. So, uh, yeah, it is, it's not a get rich quick thing, right? There is opportunity to, depending on how mm -hmm. fast you scale and what type of asset you buy, can you speed up or slow down the process? Yes. But there is learning involved systems to be built out and then, you know, you got to scale and eventually you reach a way to financial freedom. So Jenny, thank you for being on the show thank today. You. This was amazing. Fantastic guest. Where can people find you if you want them to find you? <laughs> Definitely would love people to find me. So my Instagram handle is Jenny Vega underscore AZ. So that's J E N N I V E G A underscore AZ. Or email me at cutcojenny at gmail. So that's C-U-T-C-O-J-E-N-N-I, cutcojenny at gmail. Jenny, thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. This was fantastic. And uh, I look forward to talking to you soon. Okay, thanks. Thank you.